for Kruma Media's quality, this is Saned Lamini. Joining me today is Chief Executive Officer at Road Freight Association, Gavin Kelly, to discuss the impact on the truck industry. Mr. Kelly, the country recently witnessed another truck-related uh, strike on the 16th of June, which caused a huge delay uh, on the entry and other strategic routes. What happened on that day, and how much did the economic sabotage cost our country? The reasons for why it happened were reportedly because of unhappiness by a certain sector in the transport sector around the employment of of foreign nationals. Um, So what they were saying was that South African companies were employing foreigners in preference to South African citizens. And so South African citizens were losing their jobs. So this is a group representing those people who had had lost their jobs or couldn't find work in the sector. Mm -hmm. And that this was the underlying reason for this was that South African companies, I suppose, were paying them less all the benefits that these foreigners were getting were far less. And that is chiefly because these foreigners are in the greater scheme of things illegal or undocumented or people who don't have the right to work in South Africa. So you could now treat these people differently from somebody who would be registered through the labor structures and you wouldn't have to pay the minimum wages. So that's really what lies right at the very bottom of this foreigners jobs away from South Africans and it's not unique to the sector you know about a various other organizations or programs or protests that have got a similar ring to it or a similar objective to it. And your open letter to our president Sil Ramaphosa suggests that uh, you don't believe that these blockages they are because of some trucking companies a hiring foreign nationals. What do you believe are the real underlying issues at play here? My letter to the president, I highlighted a number of things. One of them was that we are facing certain issues in the country because there are employers or companies. In this case, we're talking about the transport and logistics sector, Mm -hmm. that there are companies in that sector who have chosen not to be compliant, who have chosen not to abide by the various laws in the country. And it's that grouping that is now creating a problem for everybody else in the sector who is a, abiding by the laws, who, who are compliant, who are trying to apply their business as required by the various bits of legislation. So, so that, that's what I try to highlight, first of all, mm. is that the country is being held ransom or being sabotaged by those companies, and it isn't only in the road freight sector, but we come from the road freight sector, so I was highlighting that aspect. Mm-hmm. Companies who have chosen not to abide by the rules of the country, and despite whatever rules there are, there's no action being taken against them. And those who are compliant, those who are trying to, to do what is required, are now being caught up in this. So when you have this blockade, the people who are protesting don't target the companies who are non-compliant. They just close the road and everybody gets caught up in that. Mm-hmm. So that was the first point. The second point that I was raising to the president was that if we don't solve this and, and this protest that we saw on the roads on the N3, that protest within the road freight sector was indicative of what was happening to the country and the outside world would look at South Africa from a specific point of view. And that point of view would be, well, first of all, it's not safe to move our goods through South Africa, given what's happened in the, in the recent past, the riots in July, the, the attacks and the burnings. The second thing is that it's going to cost more and take longer to get them through South Africa because of the various delays and the lootings and what have you. And then finally, that if you're going to invest in South Africa and, and want to to grow the infrastructure, there's a good chance that will be damaged. So that is all going to move away from South Africa, which is then going to snowball the whole unemployment and the turn down in the economy. And then the third point that I'd raised to the president was that there was no action that we could see in our sector, but there was no action being taken against those who continued to break the law. 
there didn't seem to be, and I mean, we don't want the police to be the only action. So the laws of the country require that you register your employees with the various sector bargaining councils for a very, very specific reason. That being, they get basic conditions of employment and all those good things. And then we could see what levels of non-compliance and foreigners are employed in the industry, but the non-compliance, and we could deal with that before this grew into a problem, which it has done over the last couple of years, and now becomes something that manifests itself as frustration on the roads around South Africa. And remember, it wasn't only the N3. Many people focused on the N3 because the N3 is probably the biggest corridor. But this time around, it was spread right across South Africa, across a number of routes. So there are signs it's becoming more and more organized. Mm-hmm. And, and you start to become more and more organized if that feeling of frustration of desperation is just starting to manifest and grow itself. So that third point I drew the president's attention to was that he needed to seriously get the various authorities or departments who play a role in this. And I don't mean a role in in the protest. I mean, have responsibilities in terms of ensuring certain things are in place to make sure we don't have these foreigners. So that was really what the whole aspect of the letter was, is, Mr. President, this is happening. This is what we need to focus on. If we don't do that, this is what's going to be the outcome. Mm-hmm. And we know now that uh, following that uh, protest on the 16th of June, there was a, a committee that met uh, with a few ministers, as you are telling us. Are you satisfied with some of the action plans that were discussed uh, at the interministerial committee? Well, those, those plans have been on the table for at least four and a half, five years. Those aspects that are, are covered in the plan were identified a long time ago. And, and that is the greatest tragedy, is that we know what the problems are. I, I, I've now, in, you know, in five minutes, detailed exactly where the problem started. The challenge has been to address it. So, for example... You would have seen there were four ministers there. Now, the one minister was the minister of police, but really the minister of police doesn't really have to be at this if the other three departments put into place and apply the legislation that currently exists. The Department of Transport needs to do a bit of tweaking. The real determination as to whether this will be a success or not, and this plan is going to go somewhere, is whether the two key departments, which is Home Affairs, and Home Affairs is the department that issues the work permits or the work visas or the special conditions under which non-South Africans can work in South Africa and can enter the country. Mm-hmm. And the Department of Labor is the department that does the inspections and checks that what the employers are saying. So, for example, we don't have enough truck drivers in the country. The Department of Labor needs to do the verification of that statement. In other words, do the checking in the employment market, make sure that if these guys are saying we don't have enough truck drivers or doctors or engineers, whatever the case is, that they verify that. The process of looking for such people in South Africa is properly completed before they then tell the Department of Home Affairs to issue work visas or work permits for such individuals. Remember that the Minister of Labor was quite clear that in February this year, he had issued a government gazette listing what are called scarce skills in South Africa. Mm. And, and those are the types of skills that, that employers in this country, after a process of looking for individuals to fill those posts, have gone to the Department of Labor and said, listen, we can't get people who've got these skills. We need to get them from somewhere else. And the somewhere else is obviously outside of South Africa. So, Publish a list of scarce skills. That's how many South Africans, believe it or not, get into New Zealand or Australia. They have the same thing. They will publish a list of scarce skills. So you can either immigrate to another country if you've got the financial means. This 10-point plan, first thing that's happened is it's in writing, I suppose. Not that it, <laughs> it's in writing and the various parties have signed that they are going to abide by it and implement it. Now, unfortunately, the Road Freight Association, there are a number of steps in that plan. We can't implement. We're not an authority. 
Mm-hmm. We, we're not a government organization in terms of, of to police or inspect mm-hmm. or hold back the issue of operating card or operating license. We don't play that role at all. So your question as to how do I feel about this plan? I have to be optimistic and say, well, everyone signed and agreed to it. And the ATDF also agreed to that. And in that agreement, and, and you would have seen now recently in this week, they have acknowledged that there might be better ways of, of protesting and not shutting down these routes, mm. but that to be seen. But it is critical that the departments who have now accepted responsibility for what they need to do, have tabulated what they need to do and have given a timeline for that, that they are held accountable to meeting those requirements and in actual fact do that. Otherwise, four or five months from now, we're going to be exactly where we were, you know, in June. So, so I'm optimistic, but we're going to have to watch the responsible parties. And, and, and you know, the task team met every six months. They're now saying they'll meet every month. Well, that's fine as long as it's a, a, a progress report and not this just rehash and rediscuss. And, oh, what do we do now? Type thing. The reports now have to be, and, and a simple one for me is the Department of Labor now has to say, we've created or we've employed more people to do the inspections because that's one of the things they've said is they don't have the capacity to inspect. And remember, it isn't only the sector. Mm-hmm. It's all employers, as I, as I said before, but I'm focusing on the road freight sector. So they need to say, we've increased that capacity and we are now in inspecting all transporters, not just the ones who are registered, which is, which is another part of the problem. So those who are registered, the council who are actually abiding by the legislation are the ones who get inspected but the ones outside of that where the problem lies Mm. nobody inverted commas knows about them so they don't get inspected so that link between them and the department of transport needs to be forged and that's where we've got to do a lot of work and Mm. a lot of successes short term easy win low hanging fruits you can use all of those expressions but that's where the quick successes are going to happen, where we deal with those who are not registered. Mm. I'm sure you've also tabled these uh, action plans to your members, uh, Mr. Kelly. How are they receiving them? Look, our members abide by a core code. Mm. Um, For a long time, we have been warning our members about employing foreign nationals when this very, very first uh, incidents raised its head, and that must be about five years ago at least. There were those very, very first attacks that happened down at Tugela Plaza. I don't know if you recall, mm. 2018 or so. Um, our members are not allowed to be members of our association unless they can prove registration with the Bargaining Council. And when you're registered with the Bargaining Council, you have to register your employees. Mm. So we are are somewhat comfortable that our members are compliant and obviously they get inspected and then there are deterrents for them if they don't. Um, There are consequences. So in our membership base, there will always be one or two, I suppose, who are going to try and and do something that they shouldn't. That's the nature of people, I suppose. But but by and large, our members are compliant. So we don't have a problem with that. The members don't have a problem. In actual fact, we'd want everyone to be compliant because in being compliant, they are paying at least the minimum wages, which from a cost perspective makes them far more expensive than those who are not compliant. And that's another reason why non-compliance is is so um, appealing to a lot of people. And lastly, Mr. Kelly, uh, our government has recently repealed all remaining COVID uh, restrictions. What impact will this have on your industry? The last restrictions weren't Mm -hmm. as restrictive as initial ones were. So the last ones really had to do with the wearing of masks. They Mm -hmm. had to do with uh, crossing of borders and they had to do with the amount of people allowed in a space and in public transport. So that didn't really affect our industry. By the time we got to level three, most Mm -hmm. of the restrictive measures that had been creating delays in the logistics chain had been lifted. The government had realized that not only are what were they then called essential goods were important to move, but so were normal goods, any sort of goods to keep the economy going. So from level four already, there there was easing of border crossing. 
Yes, the delays that were brought about by protocols, health protocols, so the screening, the testing, and, and, and the sanitizing have been dropped, which has taken hours out of delivering and loading and, and crossing borders. So that has been tremendously uh, gratifying. It has been tremendously positive for the supply chain. I think the reality is that you will find many transporters will still have their drivers wearing masks. I think no matter how hard we all fought against it, I think for some it's become a way of life. You will find masks being worn here and there, and in some cases it has proven to reduce the amount of airborne uh, germs floating around, but definitely now it's, it's far easier to do business. And I think we as a country are going to need to understand that, that now and then there will be restrictions because of health issues, but hopefully we've learned a lot from our lockdown level five and it's easy to point you know, fingers at government now. Armchair science is a perfect science, but I think what, when they did it was done in good faith, but I don't think we'd ever get that sort of situation again. I think we've learned a number of things from that. We needed to protect our health systems. We needed to protect people given the information that we had right then. Two years later, I mean, it's what, two and a half years later now, it's easy to turn around, point a finger and say, Oh, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. But then we were all scared. So I think it's got a lot better now, a lot easier to do business. That was Chief Executive Officer at Road Freight Association, Gavin Kelly, in conversation with Polity about the impact on the truck industry.